Now we'll move to uh, Dr. Spear and would ask you also to please state your name for the record in a brief bio. Yeah, my name is Bob Spear and I too appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I'm an engineer by training and I brought those skills to occupational environmental health almost 40 years ago when I joined the faculty of the School of Public Health at Berkeley where I remain today. Although I've not worked in California agriculture since the late 1970s, my career has come full circle in a curious way in that I've worked for the last 15 years on the health problem of agricultural workers and their families in rural China, uh, but concerned with an infectious rather than a chemical agent, which is of concern to us here today. At the outset, I'd like to strongly endorse the need for the external review of the DPR risk assessment for methyl iodide not because I believe it to be deficient, but because I know the California environment has its own character with respect to the fate and transport of agricultural chemicals, as well as our own concerns for worker protection. The implications of these facts require scrutiny of the risk assessment from a variety of perspectives. And I came to appreciate this point very shortly after my arrival at Berkeley when I became involved in a study of a somewhat mysterious but long-standing problem of acute worker poisoning due to organophosphate pesticide use. But the particular problem at the time was amongst field workers exposed to residues of these chemicals on trees, vines, and in the soil. And episodically and for no clear reason, these workers would experience acute poisoning symptoms often while still in the field. Uh, but days or weeks after the last recorded application, how this could happen or that it really happened at all was difficult to understand and for some to believe. The residue poisoning phenomenon appeared to be almost unique to California agriculture. Over the next six years, we worked out what was a complex set of circumstances that explained much of what was going on. And among the factors that came together to cause the problem were the environmental chemistry of ethyl parathion, California weather in the growing season, and photochemical air pollution east of Highway 99 in the Central Valley. Regulatory actions both preceded and followed our studies. The details are not relevant here today, but there were three cautionary messages <laughs> that I learned from this experience that I believe are very relevant to the registration of methyl iodide for use in California. And that I'll bring to the attention of the review committee. And these are, first, that chemicals of significant toxicological concern as human health hazards should not be distributed into the outdoor environment without an understanding of their environmental chemistry. One of the mysteries of my OP story was that there did not seem to be enough parathion in the environment to cause the observed poisonings. We found that the more toxic oxygen analog of para parathion, called paraoxone, had been produced in the environment by natural processes after application. And this chemical, being very much more toxic, was the proximate cause of poisoning. No one had looked for parathoxone in the workplace environment because the dogma coming out of the laboratory was that it was very easily hydrolyzed and you simply wouldn't find it. This was not the case. My second point is that when a chemical is banned or removed from use in a particular application because of health or environmental risks, generally less is known about or less attention is paid to the risks of its replacement. So I celebrate the fact that this is being looked at carefully. This was certainly the case as parathion was phased out, but there's another issue here relating to the compartmentalized responsibilities of regulatory agencies. And my third point, because chemical exposures, and probably the most important point uh, right now, because chemical exposures in the agricultural workplace change from day to day as well as from place to place, the means of regulating and controlling worker exposure are much more limited than for manufacturing or formulation facilities. At the time of the parathion studies, if you had been a worker routinely exposed, exposed to OP compounds in California industry, you have had your blood tested monthly for signs of excessive exposure. Biomonitoring of this sort is not uncommon in industry, but it is impractical in agriculture. The bottom line is that there is a class of chemicals whose toxicological risk to workers may be acceptable in traditional industrial and commercial settings that are not acceptable in agriculture because of the reduced options for sustainable, reliable, and verifiable exposure control. My experiences in the intervening years have illustrated that these three points extend to many other settings with many other specific agents. 
Little needs to be said regarding the first point, the importance of environmental chemistry. We've already heard comments to that effect today. Uh, if you look at auto emissions and photochemical smog, that was once a mystery too. The methylation of mercury in San Francisco Bay, arising from coal mining in the old days. The contamination of groundwater by DBCP, the, inform uh, the infamous soil fumigant that caused male infertility. The second point stated somewhat differently is that substitution of a less for a more hazardous agent is not as easy as it sounds. Indeed, in the present case, methyl iodide does not lead to ozone depletion, but it appears to be a carcinogen, as others have testified. It also has neurotoxic properties, so known risks are shifted to workers together with the uncertainty of less understood risks. My third point about the practicality of utilizing exposure controls in agriculture that may be suitable in industry needs serious review in this case. If the reviewers confirm that under realistic exposure conditions, the carcinogenic and neurotoxic risks are significant, effective and sustainable means of worker protection may not be possible. I again underscore with these comments the importance of the review committee's tasks, and I offer them whatever assistance I can provide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spear.